Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 54. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. If you're looking for more information about the podcast, past guests, or want to catch up on previous episodes, or just want to drop me a line, it's all at the website, DesertLadyDiaries.com. And I invite you to follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries and on Twitter at Desert Lady Diary. In this episode, I'm talking with poet Laura Henley. An only child, Laura tells me about splitting her time growing up between Joshua Tree and Landers and how the abduction of a child in the National Park in 1984 shaped her own awareness of the world around her and how it translates to her poetry. Today, my guest is Lauren Henley. She was born and raised in the Mojave Desert town of Joshua Tree, California. She is the author of two chapbooks, Desert with a Cabin View and The Finding by Orange Monkey Publishing. Her second full-length collection, Starshine Road, won the 2017 Perugia Press Prize. She is the recipient of the Academy of American Poets University Award, the Duckabush Prize in Poetry, chosen by Leah Purpura, and two prizes through the Poets Billow. Her newest poetry collection, Whole Night Through, will be available in October of 2019 from What Books Press of Santa Monica. You can visit her at her website and check out her blog, which we will put in the show notes and give you later (laughs) to make you stay for the interview. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Dawn. You're welcome. I have to say, I don't get many interviews of people who were born and raised here. I'll bet. So... I like to kind of find out what it was like for you growing up here in the desert. Yeah. I often wonder how many people living here now were actually born and raised. Definitely some people who I grew up with and who graduated from high school have come back. A lot of them are teachers, but they've come back to give to the desert in some way, which I think is really cool. Mm. I loved growing up in Joshua Tree. Mm -hmm. Two days after being born in Palm Springs Hospital, or however long they let my mom stay, (laughs) I came home to Sunset Road. Not this sunset, the other side of Sunset, right? Towards the National Park. On the south side. Yeah, on the south side. (laughs) Yeah, pretty close to the National Park. When I was four, my parents got a divorce, and my other home was in Landers. Oh, okay. So, two very different deserts. Yeah. uh, Two very different experiences. I would say that overall, my experience growing up in the desert is very positive. Hmm. I have mostly very positive things to say, which is not to say that it was always easy, but some of the most rewarding experiences in life, obviously, are the more challenging ones. Right. You definitely, growing up out here, and of course it was in the 80s, when helicopter parenting wasn't such a, the thing that it is. I was, right. I was a free-range child. <laughs> Even with the police officer father, mm. um, I had a lot of room to roam. And, you know, I was a latchkey kid, so I walked myself to the bus stop in the morning, starting in, like, third or fourth grade. Mm-hmm. But you definitely had an appreciation for the things that could kill you. Ooh. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, snakes, right. scorpions. Mm. I was born in 1984, right after an abduction had happened in Joshua Tree National Park. Oh my gosh. And her name was Laura, and she was a, a, just like a toddler, a little toddler, who had been abducted and was never found. Oh and there's a photo I can still find online of the sheriffs and volunteers grouping together and getting a briefing on this abduction, and my dad is in one of those photos. Oh gosh. He was a new police officer. Uh-huh. and so. I was born the year that that happened, and I think for a lot of parents whose children were born around that time, Mm. a definite shift happened in their mind that this could happen and just like that. How can someone just disappear out here? Right. But it happens. Yeah, for sure. It happens often. Mm -hmm. And so I was raised with sort of a desert awareness. Not Sometimes it bordered on paranoia a little bit, but my, my parents wanted me to have an awareness of my environment. I think that's why I became a poet, was that heightened awareness Mm. of the environment, really trying to pay attention Mm -hmm. and listen and watch, really observe it and take things in, not to keep from going on walks by myself, Mm -hmm. but to to really know and to look out and have a sense of desert preparedness and survival. So I think that made me resilient. I think it sort of toughened me in certain ways, but Mm -hmm. also 
tuned my imagination and made it refined in mm-hmm. certain ways. So I'm grateful for that. Other things about growing up, well, in Landers, which is a fairly different town. Right. We were home invaded when I was in the third grade, oh my, my mom goodness. and my stepdad, by our neighbor. Well, and people don't really realize that even now, those things can totally happen. Absolutely. Just because it's so remote. Yeah. It is still remote. And yeah. this desert will still chew you up and spit you out. Right. If, yeah. you are, if, you, if you're if you coming out to have sort of a, a modified experience of the desert, mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to slam on Airbnbs too much, not yet. <laughs> I will eventually. But <laughs> if you're coming out and you're sort of just having this fabricated experience. Romanticized. It, romanticized, idealized mm. experience, mm. you might be in for a rough ride. Yeah. But yeah, we were home invaded when I was in the third grade. Oh my gosh. And the man continued to live there. I went to jail for a couple days. And I had to walk past his house, you know, and, and live near this this person. So that became a part of my psyche. I still have dreams about it on a fairly regular basis. But again, I had to be resilient. I mm-hmm. had to process it in the ways that I could. I'm an only child oh, as well. Okay. And so and in Landers, people don't really want to come visit you. I mean, now I hear that it's cool. I right. hear people being like, oh. <laughs> Landers, you grew up in Landers is so cool. I'm like, no, I couldn't pay people. It wasn't. I could not pay people to come see me in Landers. No one wanted to come pick up Lauren Mm -hmm. or come to Lauren's house out in Landers. Parents were sort of worried about home letting their yeah home invasions, (laughs) letting their kids come over and stuff. So it was very isolated. Mm. It was very isolated. It um, already and already in a yeah. kind of an isolating environment. Absolutely. Yeah. You so know. what were some things that you would do to yeah. occupy your time growing up? Yeah, I created things. Mm-hmm. I, I was always a, I had to create just mm-hmm. as soon as I learned how to read, you know, in first grade, I remember my first book, it was about whales. And I remember I made it through that whole whale book and I went, oh, wow, I've got the key to the universe. Mm. So what do I want to open and what universes do I want to create? Mm. So I started writing mm. like in the first second grade. Wow. It probably made no sense cuz I had terrible spelling. Just that was back when creative spelling was okay. It was kind of like, "Well, oh, I just oh. kind of go with what you think it feels <laughs> right." And so I start I just wrote stories. Mm. I would be in the 4th grade and I'm like, oh, "I'm working on a novel." You know, it was all <laughs> terrible, but it was how I entertained myself. So sure. I wrote I read a lot mm. and I painted. Mm. I did a lot of solo activities and I kept right. myself entertained. My parents, I'd be in my room and they'd just check to make sure I was alive. Right. You still and there? Did yeah. Ready? Are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. What's going on? I'd take snacks in and disappear for and I also mm. built, oddly enough, I built houses out of cardboard. Oh. Like and they never had dolls in them. Just they were the just just I liked the houses. Yeah. But I was always making things. Okay. You know, yeah. I just always had to make 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 make. That's interesting because I even though I had a younger brother, he was 4 years younger than me, but most of the kids in the neighborhood were about his age. Yeah. So, I was like felt, too cool for school. You felt like, like a bit of an only child. I didn't really want to play with them anyway, right. and I really enjoyed just spending time in my room and yes. did myself being in your and own poetry world and create yeah. some worlds and stuff like that. So, yeah. That's understandable. So I, I don't yeah. think it's any surprise sometimes that people like us yes. end up in a place like this because we're by ourselves. We know right. how to entertain ourselves, and it's perfectly natural. And then you sort of grow to prefer it. Yes. You know? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I had friends. I had a social life yeah. of some kind on mm-hmm. my... Uh, but then I just sort of came to prefer that mm-hmm. solo. Yeah, because you, know? you can read. You can be quiet. Yeah. You can stare out the window yeah. and just reflect or whatever you want to do. And exactly. There's nobody there to disturb it or change the direction yeah. of where you want to go. Or yeah, and, like and I fear, I teach college, mm. community college. Mm-hmm. The majority of my students are 18 through 23. And mm. I, I have observed, I have a concern that um, young people aren't spending enough time really diving into their imaginations and mm-hmm. I think that the iGen and the younger millennials I'm t- technically a millennial I'm 34 but mm. on the upper end <laughs> um, they're really deprived of sense of nature mm. and yeah. wonder and curiosity because they're seeing a lot of it on their phone but not really experiencing it themselves yeah. there's an answer for everything on that phone instead of really having to wonder and come up with your own responses mm-hmm. and that 
that feels like more of a desert than the desert. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Because you can be alone in that situation, but you are really alone, even though you think, oh, look at all these people liking my posts. Right. Oh, I'm so connected. Yeah. Not really. It's sad. (laughs) It is sort of sad. So thinking back to when you were growing up Mm -hmm. here and just the availability of certain things here, because now still it's not quite everything's available here but I've talked to other people and they talked about the road in and out was much smaller and things like that what kind of things do you remember um, from growing up that were different to now yeah well you could go out into the national park well before it was a national park it was Mm. just a monument so you just kind of drove in and not really see anybody which was nice. I'm glad, though, that people are getting out and exploring their national parks. So because we've had a hike, obviously, a huge hike here in... I think they said it's now doubled in the last four years. Yeah. Three million. We're approaching right. three million visitors right. a year. And this is happening at most of the parks, so it's not just yeah, Joshua Tree. It's happening at most of the parks. So yeah. things were just quieter. I know that a lot of working class families who are actually working in this area and giving back to the economy here and raising their children here were able to find rentals with ease and to buy homes with ease and Mm -hmm. I and that has been a major change in this area it was very difficult actually moving back this last time I've moved back a couple of times Mm -hmm. but this last time that we came to move back just over a year ago finding a long-term rental was nearly impossible because they've They've been turned into Airbnbs, and that is bothersome to me. As someone who was born here, without being too dramatic, survived this area and said, I want to come back. I'm a teacher. My husband and I are both Mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working at Copper Mountain College for a while now. And to have a really hard time finding a long-term rental was really disheartening. And we had to live in an Airbnb for a month ironically, because wow. the town is overrun by Airbnb. Right, yeah. Well, and I looked at, when I came out two years ago, I looked at two places that were freestanding. One was a little cottage on someone yeah. else's property, yeah. uh, but it was furnished, and they kind of looked a little squishy at me when I said, well, how would you feel about taking the furniture out so I could bring mine Right. In? So I said, never mind. Right. And then the other one was just not conducive to my work. There were yeah. barking caged dogs oh, yeah. next door, and right. I said, well, one, I can't work, and number two, yeah. I'm the guy that's calling... You know, Working cage the ASPCA dogs. and saying, I think you should come and look at the situation. Oh, yeah. God. There's there so a, many cases of yeah, that. Yeah, chain link fence. It's, well, either that it's or it's bad. the opposite end of the spectrum where we see posts for lost dog all the time, yeah, which right. is a for- unfortunate also. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But just in that span of even a couple of months of me coming yeah. and deciding and right. moving. And then looking for a place to live. Yes. Six months later, yeah. you would look in the back of the weekly paper and yes. there would be nothing for rent. Right. Whereas when I was here a couple of months earlier, it was. Yeah. So it really just has Much taken more off. plentiful. Right. Yes. Yeah. A couple other major changes I want to mention. I feel really fortunate that I was here at a time when I had much freer access to certain things. Mm. One example is the Integratron and Landers. Oh, yeah. When I was growing up in Landers, it was owned by someone who was very open to it being used by whomever. That's where my mom and I went for our yoga classes. Wow. They were very low cost. And my, my yoga teacher also taught a dance form called Bouteau. Mm-hmm. Very strange dance form. Very abstract. But anyways, we could use that amazing place for these creative things at no charge and it was kind of like the keys under the mat the doughboy pool is full swim in it just respect the place mm. and in order to visit it recently you know you got to pay twenty dollars to get a sound bath mm-hmm. and it's so commercial now and well and you have to make a reservation you, make a reservation. you can't even get in i yeah. know and this was this place that no one really knew about except for the locals and it was really respected and enjoyed by the locals and now it's a completely different scene and then another example is mental physics growing up it was a silent retreat that means it's silent right <laughs> and my stepmother worked there during certain seasons and early in the mornings and served food to the people who were there in silent retreats. Oh, wow. So I got woken up at 4 a.m., which wasn't real healthy for a kid. <laughs> but 
and we had this talk before we went, okay, this is a silent mm. retreat. We're not talking. And I went and served food, like oatmeal, to the people who were mm-hmm. at this retreat, and it was so quiet. And yeah. it, you just knew, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I necessarily believe in ghosts or not, but I'm open mm. to it. But you just knew there was, there were spirits some kind of spirits yeah. there. And I doubt they're there anymore because <laughs> we've got Iggy Pop, like rock bands that I love. Mm-hmm. But now th- it's rock festivals a couple times a year. It is not the place that it originally that it was, was right. or was intended for. Yeah. And that feels like a loss as well. And I, I know people who live in the desert and who love the desert. And I know they love the desert, but they still partake, you know, in the rock festivals and mm-hmm. or are part of them. And, and that's fine, but... I guess I'm closer to the side of preservation. Yeah. Well, and it feels like something was lost. But I do feel with the new, there's a new uh, executive director, Terry, who's working there now for the maybe the last, I guess we're coming up maybe on a year, Mm -hmm. um, and working very closely with their board of directors. Mm -hmm. And the sense that I am getting from them is that they do want to return it, maybe not necessarily to a silent retreat completely, but to a place where thought leaders Mm. can come Mm -hmm. and collaborate Although I did participate in the 10-day Vipassana mm, retreat how was that? over the holidays at the retreat center. Yeah, cool. Um, and it was challenging. Yeah. But I'm glad I did it. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad I did it. But it was so wonderful. We'd come out of afternoon meditation and it would be dark because it was in December. And it was just beautiful to watch people who were not from here mm. walk out of that sanctuary. Yeah and look like at the sunset right. that was happening or yeah. in the, the night sky that was happening. Yes. It felt really good to see people enjoying that yes. and, and really taking it in yeah. and taking that with them along with whatever they learned right. during that 10 days. That sounds so, like a very positive experience. Yeah, it was for sure. And like I said, people, not just, I mean, not just iGen and millennials, but people in general are or deprived nature. So to come out and then have an experience mm. where you go, oh yeah, like the earth totally matters and stuff. Right. And finding quiet spaces <laughs> totally matters. So I guess I better vote in accordance with the earth. Exactly. I guess I better make choices in accordance with the earth. So if that's mm-hmm. what's being taken away, mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. As long as it's not a, what can the desert do for me? Right. I'm what gonna, can it give me? Yeah, can what can I it give me? It? Yeah. yeah, I'm on a litter. I'm going to bring my drones out. Yeah. My guns. My guns. My uh, ORV. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then leave. That's what I have a hard time with and feel sad about. But the only constant is change. Exactly. So adapt or yeah. get out of the exactly. way. Exactly. And relatively speaking, this is one of the last few truly dark places, meaning like places that you can see the, mm-hmm. the stars um, that isn't, you know, overtaken by light pollution yeah. as 99% of the country is. Mm-hmm. It's still a relatively affordable place compared to the mm-hmm. rest of California. So yeah. it's a great place to live it really is i'm super grateful to be here and i'll stay as long Long as as i can can. right (laughs) do you hear that often (laughs) not really i think people are you know the people that i talk to are pretty happy to be here yeah but i've heard it more in la oh huh yeah or people that i've met that are here from san francisco right who were just completely priced out there was no way and then discovered this and are glad to be here so you know. It's always been a matter of work for me out here. Like, right. do I have enough work in my line to sustain right. me? Right. And know? well, and that's the only way I would have been able to come out with uh, doing voiceover work. I could pretty much do that from anywhere. So I didn't that know that's was, what you did. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that was a big deciding factor for me. I oh, mean, wow. there were some other things that yeah. took me over before right. I came to that conclusion. <laughs> but, right. Yeah. That's exactly. really cool. Thank yeah. you. So the poetry and yeah. how that evolved into being your main gig and and your passion. Yeah. Growing up, I wrote stories. I was all about fiction. And I did it seriously. Mm. You know, as soon as I could write, it was like that was my thing that I needed to do. Mm. And then I didn't really write much poetry, even in high school, which is like the time for getting out all that 
really bad poetry. That's when I wrote most of mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I, but I, I really wasn't. Then I, oh, and also in high school, I did theater, and that really kept me afloat. Mm. Um, as far as giving me a positive outlet out here, so I did theater. So I would write nice. plays, I would write monologues. Mm. I was really involved with that. I had a great theater teacher out there, and so I really wasn't writing much poetry. And then I went through this. I went through a very independent phase where I really felt like I knew who I was. I felt really strong and centered within myself. But because of an unstable home life, I had gone back and forth between houses. I had a lot, there was a lot of drama at my dad's house. And I never really felt like I'd landed. And then I moved in with my mom my final year of high school. And I just felt really centered. And I felt like I knew who I was. I was figuring out who I was at least. Mm -hmm. I started to write poetry because poetry is, it's a very intimate experience with yourself. Mm -hmm. Writing fiction, and I'm not putting down fiction writers because I still write fiction. (laughs) Um, You're making things up essentially, right? right? I mean, it's it's based off Mm -hmm. real life, but it it doesn't have to be your life. It could be a mix of your life. You can Mm -hmm. kind of hide behind characters. You can do all that. Poetry is so intimate and you have to really be willing to look inside yourself. And if inside yourself it's a hall of horrors, that's really hard and you don't want to because then you have to fix stuff in your life. Mm. As soon as I had to move out of my mom's house after I graduated high school, I just fell into a a depression. Mm. I couldn't figure out who I was. I had some actual health problems going on too that I I Mm. were... um, Difficult to understand. I didn't know what was happening to me. I had autoimmune diseases mm. that were running amok. But I was really miserable and unhappy. Mm-hmm. And and so during that time between 19 and 23, I, I didn't, I couldn't write any poetry. I just couldn't because I didn't like who I was. You know, that's a hard age. Yeah. That's a really hard age. And the mm-hmm. brain, we're still teenagers. Our brain is still gr- literally growing. And so we're mm-hmm. not even done developing our personality right. yet. Well, and people are after you to figure out they what are. you're going to do. Absolutely. And you haven't even really had any experiences I, right. to know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a new kind of isolation I felt. Like the most extreme form of isolation because I felt isolated from who I really was and mm. what I wanted and how I wanted to be in the world. And I just kept finding myself in new situations where I wasn't me. And so I couldn't write poetry. Also during this time, I got married to someone who I was really incompatible with. And that didn't help. We and do, We all do. That. Yeah, it, it happens. It, <laughs> right. it happens. It's my one I had that just, you know. Um, and so then I really couldn't write poetry, but I managed to move this person with me to San Luis Obispo where I went Mm. to Cal Poly to start my bachelor's. I did Mm. community college for like five years. Mm. It's finally time to transfer and I pulled this person along with me. Mm. And then as soon as I got there and I went, whoa, okay, wait a second, wait a second. (laughs) It it was very stabilizing. It was very freeing to live someplace new Mm. and to get out of old habits. And I met people in my program who were English majors and they were on fire for literature and I went oh there's so much more to life oh my god I divorced that person <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish that person no harm yeah <laughs> and then I met very shortly after that my current husband mm-hmm. who I've been with for 10 years okay. and this this human being Jonathan just opened my eyes to so much Mm -hmm. and was like, you're the person I've been looking for, but also I'm the person I've been looking Mm. for. And I took a beginning poetry writing class and I just, it opened up. It Mm. just completely opened up. And I went, I want to look inside. I need to look Mm. inside. I must look inside and I have to face it. And there is so much beauty and courage in the facing. And then I've just been writing poetry Ever since, Ever since, I guess that was about ten years ago. Okay, and it's um, and teaching and teaching. and teaching. Yeah, that came later. That came later. I it did my finished my bachelor's and then I did an MFA in poetry, mm. which was a great time. Also, that's great. And then I got sick for two years and couldn't couldn't really work very much. Well, that's interesting. You would mention that because in reading and hearing you the other night talking yeah. at the poetry reading. Yeah here in Joshua Tree, the Choya Needles, Needles and yeah. Space Cowboys yeah. kind of sponsor 
because I'm experiencing some discovery myself on mm. some health issues. Oh, really? Oh. Right, and reading a lot about yeah. thyroid and oh. learning about candida and learning about Epstein-Barr virus and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And when you say I can that, talk I to like, you about that all day. Oh, that's, yeah. yeah. So how did that all manifest for you and kind mm-hmm. of where are you now in that journey? Right. Much like most problems... Or, or even the way that we, we've seen changes happen in Joshua Tree, it's usually a process of accretion. Things are happening slowly, but we don't really notice. It's one small change at a time. More and more people slowly come out. We don't really pay attention to it. Well, I, that's a lot of... The, it's very similar to the way illness can happen. Mm-hmm. Not for everyone. For some yeah. people, it's they're fine, and then boom, they're not fine. But usually, if you go back and you explore that person's history, mm-hmm. there were red flags because yeah. humans are really good at burying certain feelings and moving on. We got to work. Mm-hmm. We got to, you know, we can't we can't be weak. We right. have to keep going. We got to be as busy as possible. Exactly. I'll drink more caffeine. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> right. I'll do It'll drink in the away. evenings. Yeah. Or if it doesn't, that's just the new normal. I think mm-hmm. people are in general used to feeling kind of crappy mm. we eat gmo foods and sprayed foods and processed. you know processed stuff and Preserve. we just yeah we yeah. we get used to that and so i had signs as a child but i think because my parents were divorced and they're both working full-time a lot of it went under the radar mm. and also we didn't know as much about autoimmune diseases autoimmune diseases weren't even believed to be a real thing until the 1950s so, I'm not even convinced that they were believed to be real then. But. Uh, and only by certain doctors. <laughs> right, yes. Only by certain Which doctors. Which is unfortunate. It seems the same way today. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, I struggled. I yeah. struggled big time to yeah. get these mostly male doctors to take my female pain and suffering seriously. I know I was laughed at. I mean, they looked at me in disbelief. And when you hear the symptoms, which are strange, Mm. I can kind of see where they're coming from. But to already be suspicious upon me entering the room, that was hard. And family members weren't always the best about it, too. You never know what someone else is experiencing. Absolutely. You never know you where they're coming from. So regardless. start with listening. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah so I, I had signs and symptoms as a child. Mm. I had terrible insomnia in high school. Just absolutely horrible. Mm. Can't fall asleep till four in the morning. Then, of course, you got to get up at five to go to school. Mm-hmm. I could have done a lot better in school had that been addressed. But again, mm. busy parents, mm-hmm. everyone just doing what they can. And then to fast forward a bit, I really crashed and burned when I was about 27. I was finishing up my master's in fine arts. My husband and I were living up in Humboldt where mm-hmm. he was going to school. I had been eating a lot of gluten because I was trying to be a vegetarian at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, I look back now and I go, oh my God. God, because I have celiac disease. I didn't know. Oh my I did gosh. not know. I was eating gluten like it was going Just out of... Just st- that, baby. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, and, and I'd never been really like that into bread and baking, but something about the gloom and mm. the, the rain, I was like, I must mm-hmm. suddenly out and bake. Yeah. And I went from being a fairly active person to literally bending over to touch my toes one day and having this horrific pain shoot up the back of my left leg. Wow. And it never, it didn't go away for years. And then it quickly developed on the other side. My legs hurt. My joints hurt. I had stomach aches. I had anxiety. I just felt awful. I hurt, Mm -hmm. like all over. Yeah, aches. It did. Yeah. And then we moved to Palm Desert for a couple of reasons. But one was there was a real lack of doctors in the Humboldt area. Mm. We were so confused. We didn't know what was going on. There were times of the day when patches of my skin would just feel like they were on fire. It was like the worst sunburn ever, and it would last for a few minutes and then go away. I lost the ability to walk. I couldn't feel the ground with my feet. It was ataxia. Of course, I didn't know what any of these things were. No. My husband and I had to sleep in separate rooms because I was became such a horrible sleeper, like worse I'd ever been in my life. The sound of him breathing, if he moved the sheets, it felt like my skin was being scraped. Mm. I was up all throughout the night, dizzy. I would vomit in the night. Mm. It was horrific. Yeah. And that lasted about a year and a half. Oh, my goodness. And I thought that I was dying. And there were times when I thought, (laughs) if I'm not dying, I'd like to. Because I was in so So much much agony. And I felt like I was letting people down. I've got this expensive master's degree. Mm. I'm 28. 
and I can't even go to the store. That was a terrible feeling. Yeah. And people in my family for a while weren't real understanding. And they thought something was psychologically wrong. And my husband's family wasn't in the picture either. So it was a very lonely time. Mm. But my husband was amazing. That's good. He was tried <laughs> and true. And we got, I'd have several appointments every week rheumatologists, neurologists, brain scans, spinal scans. Then my insurance ran out, and this was before the Affordable Care Act. And I want to give a plug to the Affordable Care Act. Mm. Because my student insurance from my MFA, which I was able to extend for a year after I graduated, it was done. And I couldn't get insurance because I had all these pre-existing conditions. And so every time I went somewhere, it was a thousand bucks, five thousand mm. bucks. I ended up in the hospital wow. overnight. Jeez. In the hospital overnight, socks that they put on my cold feet were twenty dollars. Oh you know, <laughs> and people wonder why people have to like go bankrupt. Absolutely, and stuff. I absolutely. Mean. And there's you know there's a, a whole lot more to it, but in the interest of time, I had to go to a physical therapist because I lost my ability to walk. Right, mm -hmm. and this physical therapist said maybe it's an allergy, and I remember thinking, you jerk. I am dying. This is not an allergy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go see him for like a month. I was so mad. And then I went back and he said, just try an elimination diet. And I went, okay, fine. I'm dying anyways. <laughs> right. Might as well not eat. <laughs> this was a, the beginning of 2012. And I did. I, I went, okay, I'm just going to eat vegetables. <laughs> and three days later, the vomiting at night stopped. Wow. The burning in my skin stopped. I walked to the mailbox and I checked the mail by myself. Wow. And five days later, I got on my husband's bike and I went slowly around our little apartment complex going, oh my God. Mm. And a week went by and we were taking walks again. I mean, I was still very weak because I right. had no muscle. During this time though, my husband would carry me to the community pool during this year that I was sick. Mm -hmm. And I would get in and I would swim with just my arms because it was the only thing that worked. And my legs were like mm -hmm, flopping right. behind me and the water hurt my skin, but I would <sighs> make myself push forward through the mm -hmm. water with just my arms. Wow. So I really, I was sort of defeated in some ways and I was sort of, the larger part of me was not defeated. Right. You know, like, there was, this is the one thing I can do, yeah, I'm going to do it. so I'm gonna do it. Right. But anyways, after going off on this elimination diet, so what's making me sick? Right, yeah. So I tried a little dairy. I didn't feel great, but I wasn't terrible. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to have a piece of bread. That's easy. Mm. And within a few minutes, all the symptoms came flooding back. Oh, my goodness. Just within 10 minutes, wow. I was so, so sick. So I eventually thanked that physical therapist. Yeah. <laughs> You'd send him flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote a great review and said, thank That's you. Great. So then I, I jumped online, and I still didn't know it was celiac. I thought, oh, maybe right. this is an it really is an allergy. But then yeah. I found all of these websites dedicated to people talking about their experiences with celiac. All these mm. strange symptoms. Also, while I was in the hospital, they took my TSH, mm -hmm. thyroid-stimulating hormone. Yep. And it was a 5.8, which is high. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they were like, yeah, whatever. No, if you're that young and your TSH is anything above a 3, there are autoimmune things that are already happening, happening that right. are ruining your thyroid. And then still it took another, it took until I was 31 or 32 to get the diagnosis of the Hashimoto's, which mm -hmm. is the autoimmune disease that causes the uh, hypothyroidism right. that attacks your thyroid, among other things. Also, right after I got well from the celiac, I developed or at least started actually becoming symptomatic of horrible endometriosis. Oh, yeah. During this time, I had no insurance. I'm living in Landers in my mom's old house. I had just lost my job locally, and I'm in horrible pain. And I had huge cysts on my right ovary that kept bursting. Oh, my god! It felt like having appendicitis all the time. And I couldn't get insurance because they, or I could, but they weren't going to be able to treat that ovary. I had to wait until the Affordable Care Act passed. Oh and my gosh. thank you, Mr. Obama because no one else in my family <laughs> was going to be able right. to pay for my insurance oh nor my off, gosh. you know, or to pay for my surgery. Yeah. So I waited eight months with oh this God. giant cyst that they weren't sure if it was a tumor or what, because right. I had to go to just clinics to get, you know, imaging done. Right. And they're like, we don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. 
and I was in absolute agony. So I finally got the surgery, and that was a major relief. Mm. So, yeah, thank goodness for the Affordable Care Act. For me yeah. personally, it worked out. I know some people it didn't, yeah. but for me, right. it man, like oh, it. man, yeah. it was a lifesaver. Oh, my gosh. So I am still dealing with the ripples of autoimmune diseases. Mm-hmm. The Hashimoto's is a really difficult thing to deal with. Mm. It's slippery. It's tricky. Mine is not responding to the medication. Mm-hmm. I've tried different medications. I'm on the highest dose possible. So now I'm really coming at it from a functional medicine approach, really Really, really diving into diet, really mm-hmm. diving into yeah. supplements. And it's not easy. It is very difficult and it requires a lot of self discipline. Yes. And patience and mm-hmm. research yeah. and trying new things. And so if that's something that you're dealing with the thyroid stuff, we'll have to talk more about it sometime because yeah. I've I've really I've lived it. I'm living it still. Mm-hmm. So any benefit I could be to anyone who is suffering with autoimmune diseases chronic pain that kind of thing yeah you know women we need to stick up for each other exactly and i think there's a number of even men who probably don't even realize that oh, they like can you have... said that all this is going on oh, inside yes. without you know until like you said there's there's those red flags as yes. i'm doing my research and reading oh yeah i'm remembering back to times when i went to the doctor and they thought Lyme's disease. Oh, yeah. Because it was moving through my joints, mm. and I couldn't. There was a time that I thought, oh, I'll just soak myself in the bathtub, and then I couldn't get out of the bathtub because oh. it was just so stiff and painful. I couldn't even move. It was like being paralyzed. Oh, my God. And then magically, a few days later, it was gone. Right. But I look back on that now. And go, reading through the information that I have, I yes. thought, well, that was definitely some kind of signal that something was happening and latent then went latent and came back you know many years later yeah exactly so to people listening that are having those issues start looking into those things now rather than later working with a naturopath if you Mm. can afford it you also have to ask yourself can I afford to continue to live this way so sell something if you have to but there are some really great naturopaths out there mine is absolutely fantastic it just gives you new ideas in wrapping up Mm -hmm. If someone came to you now and said, you know what, Lauren, I think I'm going to move to the desert. (laughs) Yeah. What would be some advice that you would give them or some insight you would share about what it really means to be here? I would say go and spend some time there and try not to just have a mediated experience in an Airbnb. Try to really go and spend some weekends there, maybe stay with friends or camp or do something like that. I would ask yourself what you have to bring. If this is a potluck and we want to share with each other, what's your dish? How are you going to contribute? Oh, we don't really need any more tattoo places. (laughs) (laughs) Anything that supports literacy is great. Mm -hmm. We need teachers out here. Like, really badly Mm -hmm. K-12. Probably doctors, too, I would think. Doctors, medical professionals, people Mm -hmm. who are into sustainability and gardening practices that involve little water use, Mm -hmm. things like that. What are you going to bring and offer? At the very least, how can you have a light footprint? How can you have your impact be positive instead of something that just takes or adds to something that we really don't need? Bring the desert back into some kind of a balance, a harmony. What do you have to offer? And then I think if you have that, your experience won't be disappointing. I think that's, I think that's probably what I would say. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That. And thank you for coming and being a part of the podcast. It was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Sure. Glad to be a daughter of the desert. Thanks so much for listening to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you heard something that inspired or enlightened you, I'd love to hear about it. Send an email to desertladydiaries at gmail.com or start a discussion with other listeners at the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. Next week, I'll be talking to painter Zara Kond. She tells me about her move to the desert, a bookstore dream come true, and her upcoming exhibition, Fever Dream, at Art Queen and Joshua Tree. Thanks so much for listening.